Hi, this is Trev and welcome to my blog. Of course, I've made many videos on MIG welding and TIG welding car bodywork, but there are a specific group of questions that I haven't answered yet. So that is what this video is going to be dedicated to. So the repeated questions that I keep being asked over and over again are things like, when should I use a MIG welder or a TIG welder? I'm thinking about making my first welder purchase. Should I buy a MIG welder? or a TIG welder, which creates less distortion, a MIG welder or a TIG welder. And there's also a great deal of confusion that arises from reading welding forums. So I'm also going to address that one also. There certainly isn't a one answer fits all questions to these problems because a great deal of this is subjective, but I'm going to give it to you as clear and as simple as I possibly can anyway. So I'm tailoring this video to these people. Some of this may be a little bit basic, but I did have a chat to a couple of guys at the NEC back in March and one guy approached me and he said, look, I know nothing about car body work. Can you give me a few tips? And almost immediately I was asked the same question by somebody else and the one guy actually admitted to me that he was embarrassed about asking these questions because they seem too simplistic. So that's why I'm making this video for these people. I think the first thing to establish is the fundamental difference between a MIG welder and a TIG welder. If you don't know how a welder works and how you're going to advance forward, understanding the difference between the two welders is absolutely essential. So let's talk about the similarities. Both MIG and TIG welders produce an electrical arc this electrical arc is powerful enough to melt steel. Welding is nothing more than melting two pieces of steel together in a controlled manner. Not to go into too much detail about how each welder works, let's just talk about their basic differences and we'll focus mainly on the business end, the welding torches. So leaving aside many important details, as I said, let's just keep things simple here, guys. So look at the TIG torch and you'll see that there's a spike sticking out the end. This spike is called an electrode. The arc is formed between the electrode and the workpiece. The workpiece is earthed to the welder's earth output. The welder's polarity is positive earth, negative torch electrode. Electrons flow from negative to positive. This results in the flow of electrons towards the workpiece. The torch electrode still glows red hot, but the bulk of the heat is directed to the workpiece. Now I've missed a ton of information out here, but as I said, let's just keep things simple. If we look at the MIG torch, we'll remove the shroud from the end which guides the gas. We'll just remove the shroud and underneath there you can see a copper contact tip. On the MIG welder, there is a spool of wire which is normally located inside the welder's cabinet. This wire is automatically fed through the contact tip at a preset speed. The key thing to grasp here is that the welding wire is the electrode. The workpiece is earthed to the welder's earth output as the same as the TIG welder, but its polarity is the reverse of the TIG welder. The MIG welder's earth is negative and its electrode, the welding wire, is positive. This means that the bulk of the heat generated by the arc is directed to the welding wire. This wire rapidly melts as it's fed into the arc and it melts and it drips onto the workpiece welding the two pieces together. The fundamental difference between the two welders is that the MIG welder is constantly producing filler to the weld area. So it's constantly adding steel to that welded joint. When you're TIG welding, the TIG welder is just generating the heat needed to fuse the two panels together. And then you're manually adding filler if you need it. And that is the only thing really that is worth grasping at this point. Now that we've established the difference between the two types of welders, we can start talking a little bit more about the actual welding process itself. So when you were TIG welding, a really important point to observe is you are only adding the required amount of welding wire, which means that the better you get your panels fitting together, the less wire you add. Perfect fitment means less gap. Less gap equals less filler rod. Less filler rod equals less welding time, less cleanup, etc. 
Many coach builders avoid using filler rod, resulting in the weld being undercut due to the panel steel becoming the entire weld. The panel steel flows into the gap, resulting in a sunken weld. Professional welders are quick to point out that no weld should be undercut, and I'm sure that in the world of fabrication, they are right. But coach builders have been doing it this way for decades of time. The hand-built cars that they make have had accidents and they haven't split apart at the seams. Personally, I like to add a small amount of filler rod and make the tape joint look invisible and flush. It's all about personal preference and perhaps how focused you are on productivity versus, you know, how good it looks in steel. Distortion is created by TIG welding on car bodywork. It can be rectified by planishing the welded area using a panel hammer and a dolly. This can be done quite soon after welding because there won't normally be an excessive amount of unwanted weld bead to remove. The weld bead the TIG welder creates is also soft enough to flatten out. When you're TIG welding, TIG welding is best performed as a constant stream of weld. So you'll be welding at far lower amperages and you're generating just enough heat to get those two panels to fuse together and then you add just a tiny little bit of filler rod. This is why you need far less amps when you're TIG welding and in theory the heat distortion should be less but the thing is it is a constant weld whereas you're MIG welding you're only doing it for a split second when you're TIG welding of course you're doing a long run. You completely run weld from one end to the other without stopping if you've got a bit of a curve on the panel. I've found that as soon as you get into situations where the panels are flatter, then that is where you're gonna run into distortion issues far quicker when you're TIG welding. If it's got a very, very high crown, then I can TIG weld it from one end to the other without stopping and produce very, very little distortion. In this clip, you can see clearly the difference between the two welds. One side's MIG welded and the other side's been TIG welded. I haven't ground off any of the weld, just cleaned it up with a wire brush. So if you've decided to buy yourself a TIG welder, what would my advice be on the type of TIG welder you should buy? Well, my own welder is an inverter type TIG welder, absolutely no problems with it whatsoever. And it's an analog one. You may be advised to buy a digital one. The digital ones come with presets, so it takes a lot of the guesswork out because it's already set up for what you want to weld. You still can change it within the parameters, but it takes that guesswork out. Definitely, definitely, whatever weld you buy, make sure it's got a high frequency starter. Definitely do that. And up to 200 amps is absolutely more than ample for car bodywork. In fact, you'll blow it to bits with 200 amps and unless you're going to weld aluminium then you don't need the AC part of the TIG welder. You can just buy yourself a DC one and save yourself a ton of money. The first and most important thing to say about MIG welds is they are incredibly hard. In fact if you were to try and flatten MIG welds out all you'd end up doing is putting dents in your panel hammer because those welds are probably as hard as the tool steel that the hammer's made from. So let's just say you wanted to replicate the planishing process like we did when we TIG welded it. It would mean that you'd have to remove the entire weld bead from the outside facing panel and the inside. It would be the inside one that would give you the most amount of problems because normally the inside of panels are pretty inaccessible all the way around. You'd end up having a little bit of weld bead left you put your dolly behind it, you try and planish it out and then your panel would invariably fold itself around that little bit of weld bead that you couldn't quite get to and completely ruin the job. So my general process for finishing off MIG welds is to just grind the weld flush on the outside facing panel and then finish with car body filler. If I have any heat distortion then I can often remove that by tapping it with a hammer from behind. The other thing I find really useful is a single-sided spot weld slide hammer and that can remove quite a lot of the distortion. Heat distortion is created whether you MIG weld or you TIG weld is absolutely no getting away from it and I did actually do a video on why we get heat distortion when we weld and it takes you through all the processes because Heat distortion is also heat shrinkage as well. 
and I explain in that video how this happens. So what are my suggestions for the type of MIG welder I should buy? Should I buy a transformer type welder or should I buy an inverter type welder? So let's just talk about the differences. I'll give you a few tips now on welding with each type because you may have already bought your welder. So I'll give you a few tips and then I'll discuss which I think you should buy if you haven't already bought one. So you'll have power settings on the front, might be 1 to 5, 1 to 6, 1 to 7, whatever it is. But there'll be two power settings on that welder that will both weld car bodywork quite well. So let's just for argument's sake say number 2 and number 3 are good for car bodywork. Number 4 completely obliterates it. Number 1 just skips about on the surface and there's no penetration at all. Number 2 is pretty good but it really could use being a little bit more powerful. Number three is pretty good, but you have a tendency of blowing holes. And this is where using a gap could be to your advantage because when you put a gap between the panels, the penetration is increased remarkably by putting that gap between. So you can go to number two, use less power, less heat, less distortion, and guaranteed that the weld will penetrate all the way through. Okay, so let's talk about the inverter type welder and even a gap. If you've got an inverter type welder, I wouldn't worry about a gap. I would just butt it up because you're not gonna be in this position where you're trying to get between the two power settings. And as I said, that gap helps improve penetration if you're using a transformer type welder. If you're using an inverter type welder, then it is so much easier to set up because the power setting is variable. It's totally variable. So if you haven't got enough power, you can just nudge it up slightly. You're not gonna be in this situation where it's not quite powerful enough. You step it up, it's too powerful. The only downside I would have said, if you're trying to actually learn and get a feel for the welding process is that inverter welders seem to weld a little bit too well. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy to say but they actually weld so well that you don't get a feel for whether you should be turning it up and down if you see what I'm trying to say. I know it sounds a bit counterintuitive to say that you know the welder welds too well but they really do and having said all this I would still go down the inverter welder route. Okay, so a few tips for MIG welding. Let's just talk about that quickly when you're sort of MIG welding, whether it be transformer or inverter type welder. Let's talk about the MIG welding process. So you must set that welder up so that when you do a weld, you do a weld that lasts for the minimum amount of time possible. This is why you need the welder set up far higher than you would probably imagine it needed to be set because what it's got to do, the wire has got to come out of that contact tip, it's got to hit the panel, it's got to create an arc, it's got to melt the welding wire into the arc and fuse the two panels together and penetrate from one side to the other all in a split second. That is why you need that welder turned up probably a lot higher than you would think. I've obviously done videos on welding, so if there's any confusion about this, go back and look at those and I'll talk about penetration on those videos but that's essentially what you need to be doing when you're MIG welding you need to be having that welder operating for the shortest amount of time possible but to make a perfect little spot of weld and then you're just going to skip about all over the panel until you've filled up all those dots dot to dot all joined together then you grind that off and you've got a continuous weld all the way across if you were to weld it constantly as I said you would end up with a massive hole because the heat in that panel from that weld can't dissipate fast enough it will just overheat and melt into a great big hole let's just wrap up the fundamental difference I believe between doing like fabrication work and car body work so when you're doing fabrication work you're welding real real thick materials the weld will essentially lay on the surface. There will be penetration, of course, but most of that weld will hang on the outside. Now, if you were to grind that weld off flush, that would massively affect 
the strength of that structure. You mustn't grind that weld off that structure. That is why all these welds on these structures are very visible and very beautiful as well in a lot of cases. When we're talking about car bodywork, we're talking about you're welding it up and you're trying to make it look like it came out of the factory. So the weld bead must be ground off the surface. Now if that weld bead doesn't penetrate all the way through the panel to the other side and you grind it off, then you're gonna leave yourself in a very, very vulnerable position where the strength of that weld possibly isn't even strong enough to hold together under its own weight. Now this is really, really important guys. If you're MIG welding or TIG welding, you must make sure that the weld penetrates from one side to the other, meaning that you can grind the excess weld off and it still will retain lots and lots of strength. So again, the important key to grasp here, now we're talking about the welding process itself, is that as a general rule, a general rule, okay, MIG welding on car bodywork will oftentimes produce less heat distortion than TIG welding. So if I cannot get access to the back of the panel, then I often MIG weld it. If I can get access, then I definitely, definitely always TIG weld it. I far prefer TIG welding any joint but you don't want to destroy something that you can't get behind. So that is my general rule on these things and that is the real key to grasp here. So the first key is that MIG welding produces that wire all the time, you cannot stop it. So whatever happens, you're gonna have that welding bead, that hard welding bead to remove. And the second thing to grasp is that no access, probably MIG weld it because there's gonna be less distortion. If I can get access, they definitely TIG weld it because I planish it out and make everything look perfect. In the intro, I talked about people receiving conflicting information, which was really, really confusing them. Now let's just stick to vehicle body repair. So there are three main branches of car body repair that utilize welding as a process to the repair of cars. Now, when I lay these three different branches down on you, I think you'll begin to realize where the confusion comes from within the automotive trade. Let's split these branches into three, as I said. So number one, we'll say accident or collision repair. Number two, we'll say rust restoration of cars, rusty cars. Number three, we'll say coach building. So branch number one, vehicle accident repair, collision repair. My old trade, the trade that I was in for nearly 30 years. Let's discuss that one first. This trade has evolved massively and mainly due to the use of high strength steels in modern vehicle manufacturing. Years ago, MIG welders were used extensively, but these days using a MIG welder or a TIG welder on a modern vehicle body can in certain circumstances damage the vehicle body panels, actually damage the structure of the steel due to the heat these welders produce. This in turn makes the repaired vehicle dangerous to drive. As an interesting fact, after working in multiple garages over the course of 30 years, I have never seen a TIG welder used in accident repair. That's in 30 years. I've never seen a TIG welder actually used to weld up an accident damaged car. That's a real key thing to grasp here. Now let's get to the opposite end of the trade scale. We'll talk about coach building, number three. So let's talk about coach building. What is coach building? Well, coach building is the manufacture of car panels or entire body shells by hand. A coach builder will typically make replacement panels up to entire body shells, as I said, by hand. Because of the longevity of the trade, many coach builders prefer to use traditional skills and tools. Many of them prefer to use oxygen and acetylene welding, and many use TIG welding, but very few use MIG welding. In fact, MIG welding in this trade is typically frowned upon. Vintage car bodies are typically made from marred steel or aluminium. But let's just stick to talking about steel as welding steel is the topic of this video. So the mild steel the coach builders use isn't damaged by the heat in the same way that it is in modern vehicles. Modern vehicles are manufactured using high strength steels. Vintage or classic cars 
are typically made from mild steel. Another way to look at it and to understand the difference between the structure of a modern day vehicle and a classic vehicle. A classic vehicle was built to get you from A to B. It was also built to look really really cool and safety wasn't really a consideration. Modern day vehicles they're also built to get you from A to B but they're also built to crash and to save the occupants. We've now got electric vehicles haven't we and they're also built to get you from A to B and they're also built to save the planet aren't they so i split these two guys up i said number one accident repair number three coach building so in the middle number two we're talking about rust repairs on existing cars so the things that you guys are probably most interested in so let's talk about number two in restoration we're dealing with cars that often have large sections of the car so badly rusted that the only course of proper repair is to cut out the rusted steel and replace it using a repair section that we've made ourselves or we buy a repair panel that has been manufactured by a third party. The panels will typically be made from mild steel lending themselves suitable to be welded using either a MIG or a TIG welder. Go back to the beginning of this video and I said many of the questions are from people confused after reading conflicting information. This is because they are receiving advice from coach builders that are only interested in using oxygen and acetylene welding and people that are in the accident repair trade that have only ever used a MIG welder. This is where the confusion comes from guys. So car restoration shares many similarities with both trades. It's a fusion of accident repair processes so like panel replacement, seal replacement because the seals are rusted out etc etc. So a coach builder would be typically building a car from scratch and this is the problem you see you're trying to fuse the two trades into a third trade. So we're borrowing coach building methods i.e the manufacture of repair sections. The difference being the repair sections are grafted into existing old panels. Going back to the difference between making a repair section or making an entire panel or welding a repair section into an existing old panel, this is the key to understanding which welder is most suited to which operation. If a coach builder makes a large panel that consists of several sections welded together, the sections will be assembled in a way where access to both sides of the panel is available. This means that the heat distortion created by the TIG welding process can be removed by means of a hammer and a dolly. It is perfectly possible, although not easy, to planish out the TIG weld so well that the finished panel is near perfect. It won't need lots of body filler to make it look spot on. When you weld a repair section into an existing panel you often block access to one side of the panel making it impossible or very difficult to remove the distortion created by the welding process. A good example of this would be a wheel arch replacement. Access to inside the panel is blocked by the inner wing. In certain circumstances this is where a MIG welder may cause less distortion than the TIG welder. This is the dilemma faced when repairing a rusted out vehicle but there are some clever hacks that you can use to get around these issues. But let's talk quickly about a hack that you could use on a rear wheel arch panel. For example, I won't go over loads and loads of scenarios, let's just keep this quick and simple. So we're talking about rear wheel arch replacement. Well, if you're replacing the rear wheel arch on a car, oftentimes the inner will be rotted out as well. So think about it like this, if you wanted to TIG weld it, you could actually replace the outer before the inner. So you could cut the inner out, put the outer arch on, TIG weld it round, then you've got access to inside, so you could planish it all out, and then you could weld in the inner afterwards. So you kind of do it in reverse to how you would normally do it. So you're kind of approaching the job as a coach builder would build a panel rather than somebody just basically doing a wheel arch replacement cutting it off, putting the wheel arch over the top, oh I can't get from behind, I just MIG weld it across, okay? So you see what I'm saying. Just to sort of wrap this up, if we're talking about productivity, then I think 
quite honestly, if you're focused purely on productivity, MIG welder all the way. If you want to make things as professional and as perfect as you can, and you're not so focused on the time issue, then you could go TIG welder. If your question is, what should my first choice of welder purchase be? And you've watched the whole video right through up until this point, and you still don't know, and you have absolutely no experience with welding car bodywork, then I would most definitely recommend that you buy a MIG welder first. And I'll give you some good reasons why. One of the main reasons is, is its versatility because a MIG welder can be also used for plug welding. Just give you an example, say you bought a reproduction seal for a car, you could drill all the holes all the way along the bottom of the seal and then you could plug those holes up doing plug welding to replicate the spot welds. And that would cover you if you didn't have a spot welder. So that's one thing that it's really good at. Of course you can use a TIG for this, but it's far easier to use a MIG welder. The other real valid reason I believe is that a MIG welder is basically a point and shoot welding solution. I could set up a welder and get a completely inexperienced person welding car bodywork with a MIG welder proficiently in about half an hour. They would soon grasp what I was showing them because the welder takes care of most of the processes. Using a TIG welder to weld car bodywork is a far more complex procedure. You really, really got to get the feel for it. You really got to know what you're doing. You really got to know how to set the welder up properly. And it isn't something that somebody that's completely inexperienced is going to take to that easily. So that's another reason why I think a first purchase should be a MIG welder. Another really valid point I think is well worth mentioning is that I actually got by with a MIG welder for many, many years, I mean decades really. The only real reason I really took to TIG welding was because, let's just for argument's sake say I was making a repair section for a car, so it's a fairly large section, maybe made out of three or four pieces. So I'd have these pieces on a bench and I'd be assembling them and I'd be MIG welding them and I was really sort of tired of the fact that it had such a, a nasty, horrible, blobby weld holding it all together. Whereas I could actually TIG weld it together and have virtually no weld bead and be able to planish it all out. And it looked like it hadn't been welded afterwards. And I think it was that finesse side that really, really sort of drew me towards that process. But when we're talking about doing up old cars, you may find that you're happy enough with the results that you get with a MIG welder. But if you do progress and you want to have more finesse with your work, then you could always buy the TIG welder at a later date. I mean, there's gonna be loads of kit you're gonna to wanna to buy if you get into it seriously anyway. And um, you could get yourself a TIG welder and a little spot welder, and then you'd be set up, you really would be. Something else that you'd have definitely overlooked if you've never welded car body work before and you're considering a MIG welder or a TIG welder is the issue of access. Okay, so I can give you a practical example of this. About this time last year, I had to weld my car up for the MOT. There's absolutely no way I'd have fired up the TIG welder on this project. And these are the reasons why. Once I cut the outer sill out, I realised that the intermediate and the inner seal was also rusted right through into giant holes. To gain access to have TIG welded it would have meant removing far more of the outer seal than I needed to. And this is because I can aim the MIG torch up inside the seal panel and make an acceptable weld on the intermediate. And this is where you need to weigh up what kind of work you are likely to be doing. High end restoration or getting an old runaround through an MOT. Incidentally, this was the level of the original rust proofing, a small squirt of wax well above the seal cavity. The seal cavity had no wax in whatsoever. This gave me an opportunity to try out what was a new product to me. I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent. Hey, it wouldn't be a Trev's blog video without a bit of tangency, would it? Tangency, hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, this stuff, if you're interested in restoring cars and you're gonna be interested in listening to this because this was new to me this time last year, this is a replacement for your traditional wax oil, which I've always been frustrated about because the damn stuff dries out after a couple of years and starts turning to dust, doesn't it? And the only way I've sort of found of stopping that 
is to mix a little bit of new engine oil with it and then it's more oily. This stuff is good in a few different ways. I'll quickly go over them. It doesn't seem to dry out. I looked at it only the other day. This is a whole year later and the stuff looks just like I put it in yesterday. It hasn't changed at all. So it's not drying out at all. The other thing is I put it in boiling water and it went the consistency of water and I sprayed it down inside the inner seal and within about a minute it was dripping out all between the spot welds where it seeped between the panels. Rusting is an electrochemical process and this has amazing insulation properties because it's made out of sheep's wool and that stops things from going rusty. So pretty good thing to blast inside your car after you've welded up. I think you would agree. The product also comes in three viscosities, so it's useful for outer and the body protection, for chassis frame rails, and for panel cavities. Well, thanks very much for watching. What you should have learnt from this video is the basic functionality and fundamental difference between a MIG welder and a TIG welder, the different uses and advantages one welder has over the other, possible first choice of welder purchase and how to tailor that welder to the type of work that you intend on doing and understanding how different welders are used for different trades within the automotive repair industry and also how that differs from things like heavy construction and things like that you know it's all about pairing up the type of welder you use and the processes you use with what you're actually intending to do and hopefully that has cleared up some of the confusion that's come my way from people that just really want some straightforward advice. So hopefully I've given you some straightforward advice. Of course this all comes with a great deal of subjectivity because I've given you my experiences and someone else's experiences may be very different so their advice may be a little bit different. Talking about subjectivity, I was actually taught to weld with an oxygen acetylene torch before I was taught to MIG weld. Now, because I've gone from MIG welding to TIG welding, I've picked up TIG welding quite well because I understand that whole concept of manually using a filler rod to weld with. What I have found is that a lot of guys that have only ever been used to MIG welding, they go to TIG welding, what they kind of end up is a situation where they create a hole and they find it very hard to plug that hole. They kind of just sort of chase the hole across the panel, just making it worse rather than directing that heat into that filler rod. So as I said, it's all subjective. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Hope you've got something from it and please like, subscribe and comment if you haven't already done so. I'm going to actually stay out of the comment section as regards to replying to them mainly because I just haven't got any time to give detailed replies within the video. But what I will do is I will read through the comments and if there's anything I think that's worth answering, I'm going to do another video answering these questions that come up. So don't worry about it. I will have a quick read through and I will answer these comments, but I haven't got the hours and hours of time it takes to reply to everybody. And this is for very good reason. I am still working six to seven days a week. My workshop is full now of fridges, freezers, and now building materials because I've actually bitten the bullet and managed to get all my building materials because I'm building a new workshop. When that workshop's built, then everything that's currently in my workshop now, blocking it the way, is all gonna go in that new workshop, giving me lots and lots of space then I can start making videos again. So going forward, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my business and I'm going to make you guys videos. I hope that's okay with you. Anyway, until next time, I shall say bye for now.
Imagine